Hey guys, this is Comic Uno and Comic Frontline, and today I'm doing Comic Uno episode 142. And this show will review all the comics I read this week in one show, so let's get started. I go worst pick of the week to best pick of the week and everything in between. Uh, this week I do have 20 books, so it's a pretty average week for me, uh, so let's get started. What was worst pick of the week? And that was... Earth 2 Society, issue 11. No surprise there. I feel like that's always the worst pick of the week when it comes out. Um, I'm just kind of seeing where it goes until DC Rebirth, just because I, I have read every Earth 2 book since it was released, so I don't want to drop it now. Uh, but it's still very slow. Uh, it, it still doesn't really know what it wants to be. But I will say the artwork has improved a lot just because it is a different artist and the background um, actually has a background now. Before it was just like shades of gray or orange. It wasn't really that detailed. Uh, so glad that we get to see some background. I think my favorite part of the issue was seeing Dick Grayson team up with Wildcat and I I don't even, and, uh, Green Arrow it was. I thought that was pretty fun. Everything else kind of fell flat, though, and it doesn't really progress the plot that much. So overall, I gave this two stars, and that was number 20. All right, so now we're moving on to number 19, which is... The Amazing Spider-Man issue 10. Now this has been pretty disappointing to me. Uh, I love Spider-Man as you know, but I do not like this current volume of Spider-Man or this current arc. Uh, the Zodiacs are really cheesy to me uh, and still prominent. Uh, we actually find out who Scorpio is, but how um, how invested to the story I am, I didn't really care who he was. Um, he's like, oh cool, he's an investor for Parker Industries awesome. Um, I will say the best part of the issue though, uh, there's this interesting train action scene. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, that was my favorite part of the issue. And our work is pretty solid. I, I like, uh, can never pronounce his last name right, but Kamonikoli, uh, Kamonikoli. Uh, I like his artwork uh, with Spider-Man. Not so much with Peter. I think his facial expressions are a little weird, but I do like the Peter actions. Or I'm, I'm sorry, the Spider-Man action scenes very a lot with his style of artwork. So amazing Spider-Man issue ten, though, still very lackluster for me. Can't really connect to this story, so I gave it two stars, and that is number nineteen. Moving on to number eighteen which is another disappointing book that should be better for a flagship book of Marvel, and that is all new, all different Avengers issue 8. Now, the reason this is so low is because it really wasn't necessary to bring a tie-in to all new, all different Avengers. Nothing really progresses here for either story. Um, we get to see the Avengers are all lost and like, who are we? I know who I am now. I mean, the same process we've seen with all the other tie-ins. And then Captain Americas are there to save the day in the end. Um, now, my biggest problem with Standoff is that it's not an Avengers... Uh, it's not an Avengers event. Uh, and they keep promoting it. It's like, yes, it's an Avengers. It's like, no, this is a Captain America event. And yes, there is a difference. Because for me, personally, I'm not a huge Captain America fan. I would have skipped this uh, this event if I knew it was Captain America event. Um, but they're still selling it as Avengers book and Avengers event. And they're tying it into all the Avengers books, which is, isn't necessary at all. Um, so... Yeah, it doesn't really progress the story that much, and I keep going back to the art still not being flagship material for me. I mean, it's not bad, and I do think Kubert does a better job at the artwork, but there's a lot of times where I still don't think it's detailed enough, and it's a little bit blocky, and there's a lot of times where you don't see their eyes. Uh, so just small details like that that I think could improve with the artwork. But I gave this two and a half stars. Like I said, not really totally necessary for this to be a tie-in. Uh, they could have just said, hey, Sam Wilson's doing this and, and, and done a different like character-driven um, story arc instead. So that was number 18. Moving on to number 17, which is Legend of Wonder Woman, issue 4, which was pretty good. I like the artwork, but I just haven't been able to connect to the story as much. But I do want to see it through just to kind of learn more about Wonder Woman and uh, this year one about her. Uh, I like that she kind of um, found a friend uh, who is a singer. I, I thought that was pretty interesting. It was cool that she was on Earth. I do think that this... Uh, or in our world, I will say, um, because she's already on Earth, but she's uh, on her our, in our world, in man's world. Um, I, I like that. I thought that was pretty interesting uh, to see that dynamic, and, uh, you know, I still don't really love the... 
when they go back and do all this explaining, there's a lot of explaining in this issue of this is what happened in the past. Um, not as much as issue one, but uh, yeah, I gave it three stars. Uh, I, I thought the artwork was pretty good, and uh, it's up to you if you really like Wonder Woman if you want to pick this up. Alright, so that's number 17. Now we're moving on to number 16, which is... Black Canary, issue 10. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of the art style. I think that's why this is dragged down a little bit. I think, um, Dinah's face is a little bit, like, very narrow. Uh, it's, and you see, like, these simple facial expressions there. Uh, but there's some interesting action sequences, uh, in the issue that I enjoyed. Uh, like this when Batgirl takes her cape off and, and Dinah uses it as, like, a weapon. I thought... Sorry. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, so I, I, I like that. But uh, overall, the story wasn't bad. Still not totally connected to her aunt slash, you know, also her mother type story. I wasn't as interested. But what I liked about this issue was the Batgirl and Dinah team up. I thought it was fun. I liked their chemistry, even this newer versions of them. Um, I thought that's what made the issue. But still not totally dedicated to the main plot. Uh, so I'm just sticking with this to see where it ends because it's almost over. And I've been picking up Black Canary since issue 1, so I drop it now. So Black Canary issue 10 gets 3 stars. Alright, so that was number 16, I want to say. <coughs> yeah, so it was number 16. Moving on. Number 15, which is Spidey issue 4. Now, this probably would have been a little higher if it wasn't for the plain artwork. Um, I really do like the other style of artwork more for Spidey. Uh, this is just really, really plain. Um, even the coloring was plain. Um, I, I like the, the more detailed artwork that you get to see here that we usually see with um, the Spidey series. Uh, and this is, has to do with Doctor Doom. It, it's a little bit of a filler issue, even for a book that's more of like a missing episode type book. Uh, it, it wasn't really a lot about Peter. It was more about Spider-Man fighting Dr. Doom and learning about his Doom bots. Uh, so I gave it three stars. It wasn't a bad story. I liked when my favorite scene was when we get to see uh, Spider-Man talk to this little kid and his little kid has like this heart, like this uh, this mask on and then Peter's mask is all destroyed and he hands his mask to trade uh, with the kid's mask. So I thought that was a lot of fun. I liked that scene. Let me, oh here it is. I'll show it to you. Um, so I thought that was a fun scene. That that kind of made the book for me. Uh, but yeah, this this was kind of more of a lackluster Spidey issue. Hopefully, it gets back in the groove with issue five, especially since this book was so delayed. It seems like a while since we got issue three. Uh, so I gave that three stars. And that's number fifteen. So now we're moving on to number fourteen, which is. Batman Superman, issue 31, which I didn't read part one of the whole soup, whatever it's called, Super Legion, what is it? Uh, it doesn't even say here, what is it called? <laughs> it's like the Super Justice something, it's an arc, it's part two of it, it doesn't even say, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's like the super, I'm sure you guys know in the comments below, it, it has to do with Supergirl also, but um, yeah, this issue wasn't bad. It's it's about Batman kind of reacting to Superman dying. I kind of wish there was more emotional moments there about that. But the artwork was really good. I, I enjoyed the art. I, I liked the coloring for it. Um, there's times in the back cave where it's a little bit too dark for me, um, some of the shading. But overall, really, really liked the art style. Um, I even really liked this scene, how... Uh, how Superman's carrying Batman. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, yeah, so, and also the paneling's pretty, um, interesting, too. The way they did that in, in a couple of the pages. So, I like the issue, but it's more of, like, let's go through the motions. We need to find Kara. In the end, here's Kara, but we still need to find her. So, the story doesn't really progress that much. There wasn't that many, oh my god, character moments, but still with Batman dealing with Superman dying. And uh, you get to see those small moments with Alfred just kind of like looking at Superman and saying, you know, I don't remember what he said. He said, like, good job. Uh, and, and it kind of says goodbye to Superman. Oh, here he says, um, uh, da, da. he says, thank you for everything. And he says, you're welcome. And it was kind of a cool um, paneling over there and a cool silent moment between Alfred and, uh, and Superman. How Bruce is kind of denying that Superman's dying. So hopefully in, in a future part, we will get to see a little bit more a Bruce's reaction, but we don't get to see it that much in this issue. So I gave this three stars. It's not a bad issue, but I don't know if it's really a must-read uh, for the Batman Superman uh, title. 
especially because it's 399. So I gave that three stars. Uh, so now I think we're moving on to number 13. Uh, we are on number 13, which is All New X-Men, issue 8, which I will say I really like the artwork for this. Um, even though I like Bagley's style, and I don't really think it fit for All New X-Men, it's kind of proven here, because the art, the colors are very similar to what we've been getting, but, uh, it's gorgeous artwork. Love the, uh, the attention to the detail, and even some of the, like, kind of crazier Doctor Strange moments where it becomes not colored, and, and you get to see half colored. I thought that was really cool and creative, so, if anything, buy the book for the artwork. But, big negative towards the book, it's a total filler issue. You could tell because the next arc is tying into Apocalypse War. Uh, it was totally there saying, hey, we have another month until Apocalypse War. What do we do? It's only one issue. Let's give some of the beast. Let's throw in Doctor Strange in there too because we just had the trailer. Um, maybe they knew that the trailer was coming out this week. I don't know. But, um, if you're a Doctor Strange fan, pick it up if you've been reading the title. If you like the idea of comparing science and magic, pick it up, but it's definitely not a must-read, um, especially if you need some room on your pull list. Uh, it's pretty much a filler issue, but the artwork is gorgeous. I'll give it that. So all new X-Men issue 8 gets three stars. So what are we up to now? We are up to, I think, number 12. We are. Number 12 is The Amazing Spider-Man in Silk, Issue 2, which still the artwork could be a little bit better. There's times where I feel like it's not totally rendered correctly, it like looks pixelated. Maybe that's true because it, they're converting it from the digital side. They're, like, here, I don't know why, but it just seems like there could be more detail there. Uh, so, more detail in the art, but I do like kind of the classic look we get to see. Uh, from the book. That's something I enjoy, especially for a book that goes back to the beginning of um, Spider-Man and, and Cindy's origins. So I thought that was cool. Um, reasons to buy this book, Uncle Ben is awesome and the way he interacts with Peter and even Cindy. Um, actually reminds me where I, I saw the like kind of unpixelated uh, version of them. It's during that Cindy scene. Let me see if I can get it. It's like them in the car where she sees herself. Yeah, you know, over here, it was not detailed, like, at all in that, in that panel over there, so it looked a little bit pixelated to me. Anyways, uh, the story was good, though. I liked how Sydney and Peter interacted with Uncle Ben. Um, I, I still don't really care about the main story, though, of Hydra. I think that's what really drags the story down, but there are some interesting character moments that you might want to pick up if you are an Uncle Ben slash Peter Parker fan. There's some interesting emotional moments there, um, or I guess uh, possibilities of emotional moments. Uh, it's a fun back and forth between them. So uh, I give it three stars. It didn't blow my mind. I don't know if it's a must read, but um, if you like the origin story, I say pick it up, and um, especially just for Uncle Ben. So I give this issue three stars, and that is number 12. Yes, it's number 12. So now we're moving on to number 11, which is Heartthrob, issue 1, which is an Oni Press book. It's a new book. And I will say the book starts out really good, uh, where you get to see this girl who gets a heart transplant. It's not like today's age, where it's a little bit easier to do those things. Um, it was like back in the 70s, where this is a new idea. And... She kind of becomes the bionic woman slash six million dollar man, but in a way that has nothing to do with bionics and it changes your personality. I don't know why, but I had that vibe of bionic, uh, bionic woman, but, um, yeah, her personality's changed because of the heart that she gets. She actually sees the person. Uh, and you see that, um, she's, like, starting to get angry, start yelling at people, and falls in love with nobody uh, because the guy's in her head so she's like falling in love with nobody um falling in love with her heart and uh and that's kind of how the story ends is like yes i'm gonna be more rebellious i quit my job and i'm not gonna be pushed around anymore um now i will say that like the first 15 pages are really engaging um love the interior monologue of like hey i died twice and it, it starts out that way and you're, she's getting this heart transplant she wakes up says ouch and she's like no no more ouch after the, after the the procedure because as days go on the pain 
It's not even just physical, it's mental, and I, I love that inner monologue. But once she actually changed as a person, that's where it kind of lost me a bit. Uh, because you don't know much about the main character at all, so when she's changing, you don't know if this is part of her traits of the previous character or, or this new character. So it's a little confusing the way they perceive it. Um, and then, like, once you read the ending, you're like, where is this book going to go? She's literally falling in love with nobody right now. It's an interesting concept, and I kind of like the ridiculousness of it and, like, the psychological aspect of it. But at the same time, this would be an interesting miniseries. I don't know about an ongoing. Now, it doesn't state if it is a miniseries or ongoing. Usually with these books, they would, though, especially with, like, the indie books. It'd be like, oh, you know, six-page miniseries. Or, I mean, six-page. Six-issue miniseries. Um, but it doesn't here, so I have a feeling it's an ongoing. Which, um, you know, I'll try out issue two, see where it goes, but... By the end, it didn't hook me as much as I as the beginning of like actually having a heart transplant. Um, so the actual premise didn't hook me as much as the beginning character. So I gave this three and a half stars. I still think it's interesting to pick up. It's something different, but I don't know how long this is gonna stay on my pull list. All right, so that was number eleven. Now we're moving on to number ten, which is. Starfire issue 11, which I actually think is the pen ultimate issue to um, the finale of this book, which I'm upset about because I love Starfire. But uh, it's still the, the, the different artists, which um, it's it's good art, but it's not as great as the as Lubacino's artwork that was on this series for like, I would say eight issues, which was just gorgeous art. Uh, and it's still, I don't want to say it's a filler story, but it's still in the whole Terra, um, in her planet, which I, I don't think we need as many issues as we got with that, but it was interesting because we do get to see Stella, you know, relieve some of her feelings and say, I don't want you to date my brother, and, and she tells the truth to, um, to Corey, and Corey's like, all right, then, I'll, you know, I'll move out, not like a whole uh, grudge way, he's like, no, you know, if you feel that way, we can still be friends, but I'll find my own way, so it's now your curiosity, because you know she's gonna go to the Titans show, or Titans show, the Titans comic, um, or Teen Titans comic, sorry, um, for DC Rebirth, you are wondering what she's gonna do, and what's gonna happen to characters like Stella and Terror, are they gonna be part of anything after, uh, how are they gonna leave this? So, uh, hopefully the ending's not disappointing and, and leaves on a sad note. But, uh, I liked the issue overall. I thought there were some interesting character moments, but, um, still excited to see them back at Key West. I think they, they're in this, uh, plot line for maybe an issue too long. So, Starfire issue 11 gets three and a half stars. Then now it's number 10. Moving on to number 9 which is Gwenpool issue one. And uh, I will say Gwenpool's a little bit of a Deadpool ripoff, so <laughs> um, I will state that now. But what I like about her character, what's a little different about her character is that she breaks the fourth wall, but she's actually from our Earth. So that was cool. Kind of wish they dug into her origins a bit more, but they specifically said, uh, yeah, we're not doing that. Like. I don't need to tell you my origin story, so I don't know how long we're gonna have to wait. Probably a long time to get her origin story, but um, here it's interesting that she wants to be a hero, and in the end she sucks at it. She sucks at even being like a gun-wielding hero. She's just not good at it, uh, and she ends up becoming Modok's henchman when her friend dies. Uh, who you think is going to be a supporting character? Like, if you read Patsy Walker, you think, you know, the guy she met um, in the issue, I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now, but, uh, you know, he ended up becoming a supporting character. Here is, like, kind of that similar formula. It's like, ah, he'll be the best friend of Gwenpool. Nope, Gwenpool's got nobody. He was zapped, and he has a, you know, he's a skull by the end of the issue. Uh, now, I will say, I think some of the pacing's a little slow with some of the missions in the issue, but the ending definitely grabbed me, and, um... Love the artwork for the main story. I um, really think it works. I like that's more of like a camera work type artwork where you get to see like out of focus a little bit uh, or depth and field in the background. A uh, good example of that is with um, when they show her dollar signs on her mask. Let me get to that. Like here you get to see it's more of like a camera, which I, I like that they did that style of artwork. So really clean, fun artwork. Now I will say the prologue... We probably didn't need so much. Uh, the artwork is a little bit too gritty, I felt. Um, 
Also, there is this like big cop out uh, that the cop that's driving them says, I don't want to do this anymore. Go. And I'm like, oh, that was a cop out when I saw one. <laughs> if I ever saw one, it, it was a little bit too convenient for me. Uh, so I gave Gwen Pool issue one three and a half stars. It wasn't bad, but I don't know how long this will stay on my pull list because it didn't totally grab me, but I did like that cliffhanger. All right, so now we're moving on to number eight, which is... Jupiter's Circle Volume 2 Issue 5, which is actually a lot better than it has been, even though I still don't believe we needed this volume. Uh, I like that, even though I'm not totally connected to these heroes, these versions of the heroes, um, I do like one of the guys who was like kicked off the team. He ends up telling one of the other heroes, oh, I'm sorry, um, the guy who was kicked off the team finds out that one of the other heroes was controlling his ex-girlfriend's mind because he was now married to her. Uh, so I, I thought that was interesting. And the whole other team believes the guy who was lying, which is that character. Uh, and, and you see the guy who was kicked out, um, kicked out again pretty much. And it was an interesting fight between them and, and seeing who's honest and who's not, even though... This other guy kind of seems like your generic good hero. He wasn't. He was the one who was controlling his wife's mind. Uh, and the artwork's pretty clean, but I will say halfway through the issue it changes. It, unexpectedly, it becomes like really darker, um, a little bit more outlined. So that uh, it was a little bit of a pet peeve for me. But overall, probably the best issue for Volume 2 of um, Jupiter's Circle. So I gave that three and a half stars. Alright, so now we're moving on to number seven, which is... Weird World Issue 5. Uh, now this book, I will say in the beginning, I didn't really care about this queen character who encounters Becca and our our other Freya, I want to say her name is. Um, let me see. Yeah, I think it's I think it's Freya, the, the wizard hunter. Uh, they encounter her and then and then we have the main villain who encounters Becca. And Becca's like, who the hell are you? Why are you searching for us? And then she's like driving a plane. And you know, that's her biggest fear. The only time, or second time she's driven a plane, it crashed. Uh, and now the third time, and she's driving it, it crashes again. And the issue ends with the villain actually coming face to face with Becca and being able to... Um, I guess, meet her master plan. Uh, so I would say the first half of the issue is a bit slow, but the second half of the issue really picks up. Artwork, as always, is gorgeous for this book. I love it. Uh, and Becca is a really interesting character. I would say whenever the book really focuses on Becca, that is when the book is at, at its best. And the second portion of the issue does so. It, it focuses on her story a bit more and gets into her mind. I think that's when it, again, is at its best. So Weird World Issue 5 gets three and a half stars. And that is... Number seven. So now we're moving on to number six, which is Guardians of the Galaxy issue seven. Now the reason this is a little lower is because, I don't want to say it's a filler, but it totally is, because um, it's just the thing and uh, Rocket Raccoon, what they were doing when Kitty Pride and Star-Lord were doing what they were doing in issue six. Uh, so they're trying to save some of the prisoners also, and they meet up with Kitty and, uh, or at least they are, they're trying to meet up with Kitty and Peter by the end of the issue. Uh, and then like, Thing gets married kind of in the middle of the book. That was kind of weird, but um, I do like the dynamic between Thing and Rocket Raccoon. I thought that was fun. The artwork is really gorgeous. Love the attention to detail here. Uh, so yeah, I, I gave it three and a half stars though, because again, is it totally necessary this issue? No, but it, I did have a fun time reading it with um, Rocket Raccoon and the Thing. So I gave it three and a half stars. So now we're moving on to number five. Which is, surprisingly enough, Web Warriors Issue 6. I did not like Issue 5, but they made up for it in Issue 6. And now I will say, most of this issue is the team really not working as a team. But what I liked about that is it's so Spider-Man Noir going in the corner and analyzing everybody and saying, well, you know, Spider-Gwen um, uh, Spider doesn't really need a team. Anya totally needs a team. Um, and, and he's, like, kind of analyzing everybody and saying why this team is not really working out too much and why they're not really working as a team. Um, and they're also dealing with the web being kind of destroyed, which adds into the whole May and... Um, and Ben's story, Billy's story, not Ben, I'm sorry, uh, and Billy's story, where we actually find out that they're, they're in, um, 
they're in uh, steampunk, uh, steampunk Spider Woman's universe, and they're like, well, how are we gonna get out of here? So we do find out they're alive, and that made me happy because you know I'm a huge May fan, and I don't really care about Billy, but Mayday, I'm glad she's still alive and actually in the story. But I liked it. I liked that we got into Spider-Man Noir's head. Uh, I, I enjoyed that a lot. I liked the artwork for the most part. Now, I will say, I think it was a good strategy for the story to say, oh, look how confusing everything is. But at the same time, there were portions of the issue where it gets a little laggy when they're just having action packed goes to um, Spider-Man India's world. That was a little bit boring, but... When they get back into Spider-Man Noir's head, I thought that was interesting. So, Web Warriors issue uh, 6 gets 3.5 stars, and that was number 5 on my list. So now moving on to number 4, which is Spider-Gwen issue 7, which is a tie-in to the Spider-Woman Alpha series. And um, I will still, still say the main plot of this whole Spider-Woman arc could be a little bit stronger with Cindy, but I like this is Jessica learning more about Gwen's world. She interacts with Captain Stacy. She interacts with the Mary Janes. Finally get to see the Mary Janes again. Uh, so I enjoyed all of that. I will say the coloring is a little bit dark for Bengal's uh, um, art style. Uh, I know it's kind of the same coloring we, we usually get with uh, Rodriguez's art style, but I don't think it fit as much for Ben Gill. I think they could have made it a little bit lighter, but um, yeah, overall it was fun. I liked seeing, um, again, some of the character moments between Gwen and Jessica, uh, and seeing Gwen's world as an early 20-year-old in New York, and also seeing the differences in her world of like what She-Hulk's doing, that the Fantastic Four are kind of like the Kim Kardashians of the world, <laughs> you know, the, Karna the Kardashian family. They, they have their own reality show. Um, so I thought that was interesting. So I gave it three and a half stars. It doesn't really progress the plot that much. That's obviously a big downfall, but it was still a fun issue to read. So Spire Gwen issue 7 gets uh, three and a half stars, and that is number four. All right, so now we're moving on to number three, which is A-Force issue four. Now, this is I'm sad to see that this team, uh, this creative team will be going, but I had a lot of fun with the issue. It's mostly an action issue of destroying the villain, but... By the end, you get to see the team really grow, and see their chemistry grow, which was important. Um, you see Dazzler return, which I was really happy about. I'm glad she was the one to kind of save the day. Uh, and Dazzler wants a new look. She She's, you know, a little depressed, and she describes why she's depressed. And then you have the fun dynamic between Medusa and uh, She-Hulk, who's going to be the leader. Um, so that was fun. And, and the artwork is pretty well done, too. There's some times where it's lengthy, but then when you look at the next artist, I don't know if it's going to fit the style of A-Force, but we'll have to see... Um, when we read the next issue, but I thought this is a solid, fun issue, and I, I've been enjoying A-Force for the most part. Um, I think it's been pretty fun, especially with um, the, the team roster, I think it's been cool. So A-Force issue 4 gets 4 stars, and that is number 3. Now number 2 is... Mockingbird issue two. Now this is probably not as good as the first issue because that structure was so well done, but this is still fun. And it's Mockingbird and Hunter working together to try to destroy the Hellfire Club. And they totally make jokes and saying this is not the 80s. Why is the Hellfire Club even relevant? Uh, so I thought that was fun as an old time X-Men fan. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And uh, it's just a fun dynamic between um, Hunter and and Mockingbird. And the artwork is gorgeous. Even though they had some f funky outfits on, it does make sense. And they, they poke fun at it. Even saying to Hunter, like, why are you wearing that collar? He's like, to, you know, to go undercover. He's like, you totally did not need to wear that collar. Uh, and then they also keep score of, like, who saved who and how many times. And, of course, Mockingbird's winning because she creates the rules. Um, we dig a little deeper into this whole ping pong story. I hopefully will get more into that in the next issue. Um... Yeah, it was fun. You know, I didn't really care much about the main villain, but it was a fun issue and a good back and forth between Hunter and Mockingbird. So I gave that four stars, and that was number two. Alright, so what was my pick of the week this week? That was... Silver Surfer issue 3. Uh, I had a good time with this. You know, I love the themes of... Even though I didn't love the villain, I will say that here. I thought she was a little two-dimensional, but I like the idea of 
this villain taking away creativity and what people would trade just to be perfect. They would trade art to be perfect. But then you have Alicia here who is blind and, and she says, no, that is my strength. And, and I, I'm glad I see art the way I do. And I would never trade art for the ability to see. And, and I, I really like Alicia here. And she also kind of talks sense into Dawn saying, Norrin loves you. And yeah, you're not going to be able to know all of Norrin's life. And it fits for an issue about a 50th anniversary, 50 years of history. But, um, he still loves you, and I've seen him with other people. He he cares for you. He's actually opening up to you, um, which is another reason I've loved this Silver Surfer run because I always felt like Norrin's a little bit hard to reach, you know. And this, he's a little bit more personable and easier to get to connect to. And and Dawn is a great anchor for that. Uh, yeah, so I had a really fun time with this issue. I gave it four stars. The artwork is really well done. And then you have a cliffhanger is, is Norrin Rad dead? And obviously he's not, but it's going to be interesting to see how they get out of that cliffhanger, uh, for the next issue. So, I gave it four stars. I thought it was a pretty fun read and had some really great character moments with Norrin saving the day, saving Earth. Um... Dawn really figuring out her relationship between Norrin and also Alicia being a really cool character here too. So I gave that four stars. That was my pick of the week. Tell me in the comments below what was your worst pick, uh, worst pick of the week, your pick of the week, and everything in between. Uh, of course, I'll have Comic You Know episode 143 next week, and this is Comic You Know. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Don't forget to like my Facebook page. Also, description below, there are links for my comic book, Like Father, Like Daughter, and don't forget to like the Facebook page of Like Father, Like Daughter. I'll see you guys later. Bye.